Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Daily Open Chocolate Chat here on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm the creator and moderator of the ChocolateLife.com. I am joined, as always, by David Greenwood Haig, who's the co-admin in the club here today. David, how are how are things in the UK? Things are really good, thank you. I was hoping that with with the details you posted, Sean might be able to give me the winners for the Euro Championship next week. Well, we will certainly we'll certainly give Sean an opportunity to answer that question. Um, today we're here um, talking about um, a lawsuit um, that has been making its way through the legal system in the United States since 1996. And right now it, it is actually it was a pair of lawsuits that were joined together, and op- arguments, oral arguments, were heard uh, in front of the Supreme Court earlier this term. And there's a fabulous article on a website called The Counter written by Simran Sethi, who is the author of uh, Bread, Wine, Chocolate, The Slow uh, Loss of Foods We Love, which sets out some of the case which is being heard by the Supreme Court. And it is because of my connection with Sean. Sean came back to me. I've known Sean since 2005. Um, Sean um, contacted me because there is a related lawsuit which was filed in February. And this started this you know, introduction in my um, my research into these topics. And so I invited Sean to join us today. Sean, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, no. Thanks for agreeing to um, be part of part of this conversation. So um, for people who are unfamiliar, um, who you know, people who have not had not had the opportunity to review um, the article that Simran wrote, is there sort of a like a 10,000 meter or 30,000 foot view that you can provide to give people a background on what mm-hmm. it is that the Supreme Court is deciding? The case, the case in question involves um, children who were trafficked from Mali or Burkina Faso um, to Ivory Coast, who were between the ages of 12 and 14 at the time they were uh, sold to farmers for uh, basically $40 a piece. Um, and so the case involves um, the what the case involves the question of whether or not a foreign plaintiff, in this case, children at the time, can bring a case against American corporations or corporations doing business in America under what's called the alien tort statute, which was developed in 1789. And so this is a very, very old statute. And this question before first the um, Central District uh, Federal Court in California, then ultimately the Ninth Circuit, and then ultimately the Supreme Court, is whether or not companies like Nestle, Cargill, Mars, Mondelez, Mary Calibo, Hershey um, can be sued. Is there, is there standing, as we say, um, for them to sue um, for damages? So that sounds like a really, really technical argument, if I can, right? It is. It, so, and it seems like the question is one in which, you know, so I'm sort of, I, so my, my challenge here is, I think that what, you know, we can think like a lawyer and try to dissect this argument um, and then look at what I think of are the, the basic human issues which are associated with it. And it seems like you know, that, is, that is part of the disconnect that we have mm-hmm. about what's mm-hmm. going on in the supply chain. So mm-hmm. you know, we might recognize that there is a challenge associated with child labor um, and that there is a challenge associated with illegal trafficking, so slavery um, in the supply chain in West Africa. Right. But then wh- how do we how do we connect what we think of as sort of the, the basic human rights issue with something which is, you know, that appears to be this very, very narrow point of law, if I can? Yeah, well, in the beginning. So when this case actually started, like in 2005 and it was brought in the district court in California, it's it's it, you could think of it as any other case where someone's been harmed person is harmed um, and they were harmed by, let's say, Mary Calibo or Nestle. And they, they, these children wanted their day in court, just like someone who'd been rear-ended at a stoplight. I'd like my day in court. 
I broke my back in this accident. I'm blaming this other driver for my injuries. And, and they were at fault. I'd like my day in court. I'd like to have a jury hear the evidence. I'd like for them to decide. And, and if they believe that I'm right, I'd like to be um, compensated for my injuries. And I'd like there something to be done about it. So in that sense, it's very, it's, 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 um, it's, it's tradition in this country for people to be able to bring their claims to court and be heard. And that is the, that is the key here. The key is to be heard. And what a lot of people don't understand about this case is that it has literally been languishing in the courts for 16 years because Nestle, Cargill, Mars, Mondelez, Hershey, Barry Calibo, Olam, they have, through their lawyers, forced the courts to hold these plaintiff children at bay so that they can't, they have not even had a day in court. A lot of people don't, don't understand that. So these children have had zero days in court. No one has heard their evidence. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine and, and, and to, to have to languish around in all these courts and being bounced from one court to the next in the Court of Appeals and the Ninth Circuit and then the, ultimately the Supreme Court because the other side doesn't even want there to be any evidence heard. <laughs> So if in, in, in the event that there is some kind of victory that will that will tumble its way back to the federal district court in California, and in theory, there would be a trial. There hasn't even been a trial. There's been no evidence. So it sounds like, you know, this the delay delaying tactics right, that have been deployed over the course of the last 16 years have been exactly around this area. So Nestle USA and Cargill USA are American companies. Procured the children. Um, they weren't the ones who actually sold them into um, conditions, you know, slave-like conditions mm -hmm. in the Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They didn't actually um, directly compensate the farmers right, for mm -hmm. this. I mean, they're all third-party actors. And oh, by the way, you know, until the Supreme Court decided that, you know, corporations could be people, right, mm -hmm. there was not even yep. any idea that, you know, that this is, is something could be brought. So this sounds like you know, yep. what it is that's going on in the last 20 years. It's all around these sort of really abstruse concepts of the law, which is why I'm saying, you know, think yep. like a lawyer. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. And by the way, and I would say, I mean, th these these lawyers for the companies that you just named, they are legitimately defending their clients. I mean, they're not doing anything yeah. wrong. I mean, any any lawyer would be negligent for not doing what they did. It's just that it's abhorrent. I mean, it's 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 terrible. And yes, they're making a very, very um fine point argument on this question of immunity that's what it really boils down to is whether or not um, these companies can claim that they are immune from being sued under the alien tort statute now the standard is that they knowingly aided and abetted this behavior so you're right they didn't you know uh you know, facilitate this auction for these children at forty dollars a person, but the argument um, is being made <clears throat> that these companies knowingly aided and abetted this practice, and under the Alien Tort Statute. So, one 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 of the arguments, of course, is that at a minimum they should be allowed to bring forth this evidence, um, but. What happened in the district court way back when is the, the lawyers for Nestle uh, et al. decided they would tell the judge, look, judge, um, there isn't even a claim here. Even if they could bring evidence, there's no way they can make it's called a motion to dismiss. And they and, and they won that. <laughs> and so so there hasn't even really been an opportunity to develop evidence of. The, 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 these corporations um, knowingly aiding and abetting. Now, this is under the alien tort, tort statute, and we'll get into the discussion uh, uh, hopefully a little bit on this other case that was filed in February. In my view, 
that is a is an easier standard for them to meet, which is that these companies knowingly benefited. That's different. That's passive. Um, and we there, there, I, there is no way that they can defend an argument that they did not knowingly benefit from this. Right. I mean, that's that's almost impossible. Well, I, at which point what I would do is I think that, you know, the two companies that are involved in this particular case, which are Nestle and Cargill, and the, there are seven companies that I believe are involved in the international rights advocates say, uh, uh, international rights advocates case of which two are Nestle and Cargill, at least they're U.S. subsidiaries. So, you know, I think that all of these companies have said are voluntary signatories to the Harkin Angle Harkin Angle Protocol, and right. and I would think that that's tacit admission that they know the problem exists that they're all committed over the course of the last you know sixteen years, nineteen ninety six, yeah. In the, in the last 15 years to, to try to address the problem, what they've just been continuing to do is punting the problem down the field. Right. But, but, and I should say that you're right. And it, it's, it, it's, it, it's not tacit. It, it, it is admission that, that this problem exists and it exists in their own supply chains. And as a matter of fact, this is one of the defenses that they are now using and they're saying uh, and did say in oral argument and have said um, uh, um, via their spokespeople from these companies that, look, <clears throat> we have admitted that this is a problem. And now you're using that admission against us. We, we should we should be able to come to the table uh, and negotiate with you as we have under Hark and Engel uh, and the years uh, ensuing. And we should and, and that and that admission should not be held against us because we're trying our best to eliminate and eradicate this problem. Yeah, and it is it is a really really interesting problem um, because you know one of the contours of the problem is this. I had a chance to speak with uh, Terrence Collingworth. So for those in the audience who do not know, um, Terrence is the lead of the International Rights Advocates Organization that um, filed the second lawsuit that Sean is mentioning. And one of the and things, the first one and the first oh I didn't know that he was also yep. involved yes. in the first one okay yep. so yep. Uh, thank you for for letting me know but one of the things that Terrence one of the one of the one of the sources that Terrence cites in the second suit is the National Opinion Research Center and they talk about um, some estimates at the, about the number of children who are involved in um, child labor some of it is just regular mm -hmm. farm labor some of it would be considered to be the worst forms <clears throat> of child labor under Hark and mm -hmm. Angle. And some mm -hmm. of it would be considered to be slavery, you know, child trafficking. And what I think is very interesting is sort of the discrepancy, which is between this. And so NORC says there are 1.3 million people involved, 1.3 million children who are involved mm -hmm. in some form of child labor. But of that 1.3 mm -hmm. million, you know, I think the estimate that Terry came to is there are probably about 13,000 of them that legitimately could be called slaves, right? Um, no, you and I would both agree. Well, no, no, I, no, I don't think that's what he would say. He would say, Terry would say that of the 1.58 million children identified in the NORC report that you list uh, for your, uh, for your listeners um, in your folder um, from among those 1.58 million children in involved in, in labor in the cocoa supply chain, Terry would estimate that 95% of those children are involved in what you described as the worst forms of child labor, which is prohibited by um, the ILO. And all of the all of these companies are signatories and participants in the ILO, um, which is uh, convention number 182, ratified by the U.S. in 99 and by Cote d'Ivoire in 2003, and what and and so he's he is is extrapolating this as 95 percent of the 1.58 million children are involved in the worst forms of child labor, which is hazardous work. So he's saying that this involves machetes, the use of pesticides and chemicals without proper protection, um, and he would further make the argument and does make the argument that at a certain age, these children are all slaves. They're all forced labor. Why? Because they, do, they have not reached an age of consent 
So this this is internationally accepted law everywhere that children at a, at some age can't consent in any form, and therefore their labor would be um, de facto forced. And and to me, this is this is you know one of the real problems is that there's this kind of um, there's this this image that is that, that has been promoted by some of these big companies that it's you know it's it's akin to the 12 year old on the farm in Wisconsin you know that that milks his milks the cows for his parents and you know uh, bales hay in the summer for his parents uh, on their farm that is not what we're talking about this is not this is this is is, is, is this is far, far, far afield from what we're talking about. That image is false. Right. No. And, you know, and you, Sean, as I was about to say, you would and I would agree um, that these numbers um, are presented um, in ways that are much more highly nuanced. So I did have the conversation yeah. Yeah. specifically with Terrence. There's this number in the NORC report. We have this percentage of them that are are unable to consent. Um, I was specifically mm-hmm. talking about the number that he would identify as being trafficked into Cote d'Ivoire from Mali mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Burkina Faso, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because we were talking about what is the what is the class of people that is represented. So if you have a class action, the eight John Doe's that are part of this this new suit mm-hmm. represent a mm-hmm. class of how many people? And that was the point that right. I, that's that's I, the I, point I, that yeah, I was yeah, that, yeah. that I was getting yeah. to. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, nonetheless, we would all agree that one is one too many. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to, you know, trying to, you know, sort of peel back some of the layers so that there is an understanding of some of the nuance um, and understand where the arguments are coming from so that what we can do is we can come to an informed opinion of where we sit on the side mm-hmm. of these articles. Mm-hmm. You know, part of me says, mm-hmm. yeah, I understand, um, you know, what you said, the lawyers on behalf of, you know, the defendants, you know, Cargill, mm-hmm. um, Nestle, mm-hmm. I mean, would be held negligent if they did not do their work on behalf of their customers. It is their job um, to look at the law and say, okay, mm-hmm. this is it. But let's, let's before... Before we get to a couple of questions, Christian's been very patient. I mean, Lynn, we had a room a couple of weeks ago on poverty, and Lynn was a, has been working in the area for quite some time. Let's, let's jump forward, if we can, Sean, and see um, what some of the impact might be. So um, specifically in the, in the new suit, the TVPRA suit, the, so this is the Traffic Victim and Pro- Protections Act, um, mm-hmm. there are some remedies which are requested. And one of the remedies is like disgorgement of all profits, which are associated with this. Um, so how do we balance? I mean, the, you know, this is from the lawyer's perspective. You know, mm-hmm. How do we balance mm-hmm. you know, f- you know, if there is a decision? You know, in the EU, we have this regulatory framework that's about to say, mm-hmm. if you cannot certify that you know there are no bad labor practices and you're not performing any kind of deforestation in your supply chain mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. you cannot sell your product in the eu right yeah we'll see if that actually passes well but, i mean yeah. there we'll see if that actually passes and you know how long you know there might be a delay of one or two or three or five years where people are you know figuring out this problem but you know mm-hmm. what what is the impact to the global chocolate economy Right. If, in fact, you know, the the, the oh, judge... if they don't get to use slaves anymore. Yeah. Well, well, but but but, but 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 it's, it's a little bit different from that. It's like, OK, we're going to put an embargo on products. Right. Mm-hmm. Until you can prove that you solve the problem. I mean, to some mm-hmm. extent, to some extent, this is not an immediate problem. And I, I, and I want to explain mm-hmm. to people why, because, Sean, one of the things that you said is that this whole thing in the Supreme Court is whether or not the plaintiffs get a chance at trial, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So right. if it right. gets kicked back to the District of California, <laughs> yes. it could take years before, and these kids no. are now 28 or 30. It won't. Right? It won't take right. years. They are. No, it won't. Okay. I said, what I said was, I said they would go to trial in theory, not in practice. If they win in the Supreme Court, there will not be a trial. Okay? There will not be a trial. Um, there will be a settlement? 
yes, you okay. can write that down. This is being recorded uh, June 9th, 2021. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll put a chocolate bar on that bet. Um, no, there's not going to be, there is, there is not going to be a trial. There will be a settlement because this will break this, a, deci a decision, a favorable decision in the U.S. Supreme Court in this case or in the TVPR case or in the Customs and Border Protection case will um, be one of the cards at the bottom of the pile that will pull down the house of cards for the practice of using child slaves uh, in the cocoa supply chain, period. Well, okay. Um... I can understand, you know, why that would be the why that would be the case, um, you know, because um, certainly I think that some of the implications, there are some doomsday scenarios. So, for example, in the core in the Customs and Border Protection, the case that you mentioned, the specific remedy is that these American companies would no longer be able to import products um, into the United States where there was any connection to illegal child labor anywhere in the supply chain, yeah. which basically means right. that, you know, there would be no, not only, I mean, you know, you know, these companies would have to, you know, complete, it's just not possible. It's just not possible. And, you know, all mm -hmm. of, and, and, you know, the lives and livelihoods of tens of millions of families around the world would be negatively affected. The economy of Ghana would be devastated. <clears throat> the economy of Cote d'Ivoire would be devastated. This would never happen. Right. Um, yeah. I, right. But but we've seen push and pull and we've seen push and pull on this already in the last two years. We've seen what's happened with the living income differential. We saw how Hershey pushed back on that. I mean, Hershey didn't care. They didn't care what the public said or what anybody said or articles being written about them. They were literally telling the governments of Ghana and Ivory Coast, we're not. No, we're not doing it. Make us. We're not doing it. I mean, so they don't care. These these companies don't they don't care about the negative publicity that they would get for something like that. And and really, when you boil, look, the, <clears throat> the reason why I said there won't be a trial is because who who governs all of this? Who governs all of this? This question at the end of the day, the governance of this question and how it will all be solved is on Wall Street. So this is all of this is a shareholder value earnings per share question. Um, and um, it is what it is. The reason why um, slaves are are permitted in the supply chain, both adult slaves that are in forced labor, uh, de facto slaves that are paid, you know, just you could call them farmers, but. I mean, that are that are making a dollar twenty five a day and child slaves is because of it's because the the target margin profile for these companies, you know, whichever one you want to say um, their target margin and their earnings per share are dependent on um, slavery in the supply chain as it exists. It wasn't always that way, um, but 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 the people who track these things say that it's really been happening uh, specifically in the last 20, 25 years. And so that's why if there's any kind of victory in any of these cases, there will be a reckoning um, and there will be some solution. The market will drive a solution to this. And I'm not sure that it's going to be in, you know, it's not going to be the World Cocoa Foundation, which is just basically a marketing arm of the, the defendants in this case, or the ICI. Or it's 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 going to be uh, related to the price that these farmers are getting at Farmgate for their cocoa, in my opinion. Great. Hey, Christian, before I bring you up, what I want to do is I just want to say to everybody in the room, let's do a quick reset. We're here on the Daily Open Chocolate Chat, the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. We're discussing both the Nestle Cargill uh, case that's in front of the Supreme Court, as well as the TVPRA suit and related suits. Um, which are being litigated here in the United States with Sean Askinosi, who is the founder of Askinosi Chocolate, who, among other things, is uh, in one of the amicus briefs in front of the TVR, TVPR, TVPRA suit. Um, Sean ATS. I, uh, ATS, not it, the TVPRA. I'm not yet. confused between the two of those I, things. I know, that's I mean, okay. It's, 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 right. it's it very, confusing. It is very, very complicated. Um, and yeah. 
So with that, um, you know, Christian, um, you raised your hand first. So please, you're next. So it's so funny because I like accidentally raised my hand as I was waking up this morning and I grabbed my phone without my glasses on. But I do have a really important question for Sean. Sean, it's been so fascinating, interesting listening to you this morning um, because I'm really passionate about this, this area. Um, I, I'm, I haven't been called to be in a courtroom, but um, I'm definitely uh, music to my ears and the call for social justice in this supply chain. So um, what I heard you say is, was also music to my ears that you believe in a market-driven solution. And for me, what I've seen since I've been in this industry is that to really change it, we need to increase the cost of cocoa and really promote premium cocoa so that Nestle, Cargill, and these other companies aren't buying the premium stuff that's in the supply chain so that you pass more value down through the supply chain. And so I'm, I'm a bit of a libertarian. You see my, um, my eyes. Uh, I'm a Bitcoiner as well. I'm involved mm -hmm. in cryptocurrency with Coco. And, um, you know, I, I just I want to know if I can confirm that with you, that are you seeing this as like the real solution for the market, market driven through capitalist ventures? Yes. Um, here's, here's what I, I, th I think that um, we, we know, we, we, those of us who import any kind of agricultural commodity, and I do and have for 15 years, we know that um, regulatory, um, re the, the regulatory environment, let's just say the Food Safety Modernization Act and the, and the regulations that followed it, um, having to do with, let's just say, foreign supplier verification programs and things like that, which are in any agricultural commodity coming into the United States, the, that regulatory framework can, can play a role in putting some boundaries or some enforcement checks in these things that we're talking about. Absolutely. Because it's doing it now. It does it now. It just, for whatever reason, has decided that um, we might check to see whether or not avocados have been adulterated coming out of Mexico and hold them forever um, <clears throat> at some port of entry. But if we uh, know that 12-year-olds um, were in the supply chain of cocoa, you know, making nothing and being, you know, treated as slaves because they are <clears throat> slaves, then we're going to just let that pass on through. So we know that a regulatory framework can have some enforcement effect and some guidance and some real structure as to how this would play out. But in my view, the impetus for real change is going to be related to the price of cocoa at farm gate. And I'm saying that because I don't give a rat's <clears throat> behind about fair trade price or the world commodity price or all of that mumbo jumbo. It really boils down to what the farmers are getting at farm gate and what they're paying employees that are helping them, you know, break open the pods and gather this stuff to ferment and dry it. And the only place I would quibble with you is I would say it has nothing to do. In fact, I would say the exact opposite has nothing to do with premium cocoa and everything to do with crappy cocoa. We need to make sure that the lowest of the low quality of cocoa's price is higher. We have to raise it from the bottom because the people who are buying premium cocoa are never gonna move the needle, ever. We have an example of this, coffee or other commodities. We, can, we are not going to move the needle, but the market can move the needle the market can move the needle at the bottom and the bottom needs to come up. And so instead of it, I don't know what it is today, but instead of it being, you know, 2,300 or $2,400 a metric ton, it needs to be five. And the farm gate price needs to be higher. And there are studies proving the causal relationship in a positive way between the price at farm gate of, of, of cocoa and the diminishment and elimination of slave labor. And Sean, if I can, if I can jump in there and, and, and Christian, I, I do want to give Lynn an opportunity because she's been extremely patient as well. So Sean, you know, I, you know, I've held for many, many years, what we need to do is we need to decouple the market, right, from this whole thing. We need to be thinking about the farm gate price. And I think one of the confusions that many people have 
again, these layers and layers upon complications. So when they see the market price is 2300 or 2400 often that market price is what's called SIF, which is cost insurance and freight. And that $2,300 price might actually be the delivered price to the port, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it might be to Antwerp or Amsterdam or the port of New York, right? And it bears actually no, very little relationship often to the farm rate price. So for example, in Ghana, where there is a very strict regulatory regime, there is an organization, Cocobod, the government cocoa board, which is responsible for buying and selling all cocoa. They issue all licenses, and the price that they pay is discounted by 40% to the farm gate price. Right? Mm -hmm. So there are these layers of complexity. And before I invite Lynn up, what I wanted to say, I think it's you know, fundamentally ironic that a company like Hershey, which is known for its philanthropic attitude towards employees in its founding, the, the creation of the Hershey town, the setting up of the orphanage and all that kind of stuff, is taking this particular position right now. I mean, there, it's like, you know, Milton Hershey would be, I think, spinning over in his grave um, if such mm -hmm. a thing were, were possible. But also you mm -hmm. bring out a really, really important point is that the, there is a fundamental conflict of interest here. Um, you know, the purpose of a C corporation, and this is increasingly the case since Milton Friedman's you, you know, economic theory you know, became rooted in the United States primarily in the 1980s um, under, under Reaganomics, which is the primary, you know, profit is the only reason for these companies to exist. They have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize return to shareholders. And so it is in their, they're required under their charters to do everything they can to minimize the cost of inputs. And they will do everything they can to do that. And even if I'm a private company like Cargill or Mars, if I want to remain competitive in the marketplace and be able to sell my products at a price on the retail shelf that is in line with these, with these public companies who've got this responsibility, I have to engage in the same practices. I just, I just have no alternative. Um, and so there, I think there's something fundamental about the, the way, I mean, so you know, capitalism is not a thing. It is a range of behaviors. And some of, the, some of them are good and some of them are not so good. And so the notion that, there well, are, if I can, you know, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, 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 no. I'm interested in hearing well, what you have to say. Well, well because, because, yes, yes, the, du the duty to shareholder is paramount, the duty to return on investment. And this is what I was saying, this, this, this sort of target margin and, you know, the sh shareholder value, earnings per share. These are all um, duties of the firm um, to maximize these um, for their shareholders. However, <laughs> the duty does not include illegal behavior. Period. It, do, it, it right. doesn't. The duty doesn't include, right. um, you know, robbing people at gunpoint so you can steal their commodities and put it in. So, so, so that duty, the duty is limited, and one of the limitations, of course, is illegal behavior. So the firm cannot um, conduct or engage in illegal behavior in order to maximize shareholder value. We don't even need to get into the question of whether or not it's moral to use child slaves or adult slaves, for that matter. We don't have to address the question. It's just, it's just illegal. Right. You can't do it. So, Sean, let's 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 put a let's put a a, a block there because I think um, we've reached something you know really really fundamental in terms of our understanding of things. And I, I want to come back to it, but first I want to give Lynn some time to either say what it is she has to say or ask you a question. Hey, Lynn. Hi. Hi. Great conversations. Um, I wanted to first go back to when you were talking about the amount of children who are trafficked. And um, just because if you know, I've been working with Mickey Mistrati and Terry Collingsworth for a little bit now, and they're both sort of involved with my project at the moment. And um, one of the interesting pieces of work that Mickey did in the past was when he went to a village in Burkina Faso um, searching for some of the children and the staggering amount of finding out from one small village that between 400 and 450 children a year are trafficked from that one village. And so if you then imagine that from many, I mean, this isn't a town, this is a village, 
So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a huge amount. So it was just, you know, when you were talking about that was when I raised my hand. And um, to, to, mm-hmm. it, it's that, that's, there is a piece of film on that which, which actually isn't seen enough. And I, and I tell him that, that that's just as important. I think going to the villages where the children are taken from is just as important as seeing where they're taken to. Um, right. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and yeah, I agree. I, I, I agree with, with most of the stuff you're saying. Um, uh, and and none of that, you know, I, I don't personally believe that any of these big companies, you know, it is in their interest to to change those practices of, of abuse because of all the things you've just been talking about. And uh uh, and it's not just about the money, as I've said before, when we were talking about poverty, it's about um, changing the power dynamics as well. Um, and, and the way that, that people are kept in poverty, um, it, it suits them. So, yeah, that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. No, Lynn, thank you very much. It's a very, very complicated uh, situation. So I had... Uh, it was a it was a great pleasure. I mean, I had a chance to work for about two years with uh, Robin Romano um, before he died. Robin was the director of photography, working beside Mickey Mistrati on the dark side of chocolate, um, and you know, getting you know his firsthand experience of doing these um, video interviews and and following things along. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that you know one of the really interesting challenges here which we tend to overlook is that, you know, child labor slavery, let's, let's not sugarcoat it, you know, any form of slavery, um, it, you, know, you know, by people who are unable to consent or people who are forced to against their will um, is a symptom of a much larger problem. And, you know, when, you know, the, one of the questions that your, your mention of um, Burkina Faso here is, you know, what is going on in Burkina Faso and Mali, right, which says that, okay, selling my children into slavery in, in uh, the Ivory Coast seems like a good idea. I mean, I mean, this is the thing that's, you know, th- th- it is stunning. So, yeah, these children um, are a part of a much larger sickness Uh, And I think that, as you have discussed, you know, going back, right, and sort of peeling back the layers, peeling back the onions and trying to understand, okay, you know, what are the underlying conditions that need to be addressed in order to be able to um, create a systemic solution? Um, That's what I think is, is, it is the real hard problem here to understand that because it's, it's social and it might be different in Burkina Faso or Mali or any one of these other places. Certainly the conditions in each of these countries is really different. Can I just say that I do not blame, I do not put any blame onto the families or the farmers oh, uh, or even the traffickers. This is, this is yeah, not, just this is not judgmental. This is not no, judgmental. No, 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 I know that. But it's, just, that. You know, it's just that, you know, we're, we, we focus on a problem in the folk, not we, there is a focus on a problem. It's visible in the Ivory Coast, for example, right? But to some extent, the problem... Um, has some origination or some contribution someplace else, and that also needs to be taken a look at. Yes, Sean. I would. I would only. I would. I would. And thank you, Lynn. And I. I agree with you. I would only. I would only um, uh, say that I don't agree with one thing that you said. I do blame the traffickers. So I don't blame the farmers. I don't blame their families. But the traffickers. I'm sorry. I'm going to. Uh, They're poor to as well. Them. They're living in extreme poverty they, too. They. They. They yeah. may. They may be. But uh, they are adults, and they are rounding up children at bus stations and driving them to um, Ivory Coast and, and, and getting a fee for it. And they may be poor, uh, but I'm sorry. I, 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 they, 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 there are laws against that, and those laws need to be enforced, mm-hmm. and they're not being enforced currently uh, in many situations. And so, yes, they are poor, and you're right. We do have to have... We, ne- we need to have social programs that, that, that are end-to-end solutions in this supply chain, including the traffickers, but I'm not going to let them off the hook. Uh, it's criminal, uh, even in their own countries. I mean, it's, it's criminal for that behavior and has been for a long time. And so for me anyway, and I understand where, you, where you're coming from, that that poverty might be uh, uh, kind of a defense, but not in my view. 
yeah, I, I'm not saying it is a defence. What I'm saying is it's, it's all part of uh, part of poverty. Sure. And extreme yes. Poverty. Yes. And po- yeah. uh, in, when you live in extreme poverty, you're surrounded by violence. You know, poverty itself is a form of violence, and you know it, it's 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 part of it, and and that won't go unless mm-hmm. poverty is addressed. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we, yeah. we Clay and I have both. Clay and I have both. I mean, and I mean, we 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 have traveled. Um, together at origin and i remember specifically when we were traveling in mexico you know 14 years ago uh that we came head to head with these sort of intermediaries uh, and that's putting it nicely who were who were making money ripping money off of farmers essentially essentially behaving as mafia they were predatory um and yes 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 and they were poor and they were poor and they themselves were in poverty but their behavior um at some point, they need. I think they needed to be responsible for their behavior. Yeah, absolutely, Sean. And you, my point, my point here, and Lynn, you know, absolutely. And this is why you know, I knew I I, I sensed that this was going to be the topic um, you were going to discuss about is we is that there is this um, there is this focus on what's going on in cocoa farms in Ivory Coast. Um, to a lesser extent, Ghana, but there are other child labor problems um, in Ghana. But this is also something that exists in other supply chains. It's not limited to the cocoa supply chain. And it all mm-hmm. comes from, I, I think that, you know, again, you know, child trafficking is a symptom of a problem. And if we're going to address that problem, right. there, is a, we, there is the absolute requirement to go and look and say, what are the underlying causes and to address Absolutely. those causes. And it needs to be systemic. It, you know, it needs to look at, okay, what's going on in Burkina Faso and Mali, other places in the world? You know, what are the conditions under which it's okay for somebody to traffic, right? And, you know, these are predatory human beings, you know, irrespective of what their, motive, their pressures are, right? Clay, the problem, the problem is greater than that. The, the, as you said, the focus is on the chocolate industry just now, and the whole world is looking to see how we react and respond. And it will be to our shame if on our watch we don't sort this, because the rest of the industries who are doing similar will just have a license to carry on doing that. We're on stage, we're on show, the whole industry, a $100 billion profit industry, and we've got to, we've, on our watch, we've got to try and do something about it. Here, here. I definitely agree. So, John from Belize, how are you today? Hey, good morning, gentlemen, and uh, Clay, Sean. Thank you so much uh, for tackling this subject, uh, monster subject uh, for sure. Uh, so, my two cents is if you want to put an end to this, or you have to. So we're not going to be able to put an end to it, but we can, like Churchill said, this is maybe we can start the beginning of the end, right? Um, but I would say go back and read. Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, published in 1906. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time, the meatpacking industry in our country, in the U.S., mm-hmm. was was every bit as as frightful as what's happening today uh, with with respect to this subject, right? So when his book came out, um, eventually, now he had certain political goals with the book, um, but when that book came out, the public it was a best phenomenal bestseller the public was so horrified at what was happening in the meatpacking business even though this was a novel right um that uh roosevelt president roosevelt uh, appointed a committee to go around and visit meatpacking plants and, and eventually uh, it led to the cause of the pure food and pure food act or pure food and drug act which eventually became the, the fda right uh, which probably at some point spawned a, you know, OSHA and DHEC and whatever. So in this country, 1906 to, what, 1930, let's say, is when probably the FDA, I'll bet it, I'll bet it was under um, FDR, not Teddy. So there's two President Roosevelt I'm talking about. So I'll bet it took 25-plus years to start making things better. Um, so I think in order to tackle this problem, this ugly problem of child slavery in the cacao business, and, and like you said, Clay, and other forms of, of uh, supply chains, you know, what the, the, the element that's needed to make batteries and for our phones and stuff, mm-hmm. 
that's what it's going to take. It's going to take something seminal like somebody riding the jungle. And then can I push back on can I push back on that for just a second? Uh, do you mind? Sean, please do. Yeah, yeah, let's go. OK. No, no, OK. Sure. And I'm and I'm let's just for I'm, I'm being a little bit rhetorical here, uh, if, if you don't mind. Um, nobody cares. OK, right. nobody cares. They did care in 1906. They were they read in 1906. People don't read. They watch YouTube. Okay, maybe we can do a YouTube video or something that's going to do it. People don't care. If people don't care about what happened to George Floyd, if people don't care about our children getting shot with automatic rifles rifles in classrooms, why are they going to care about this? They're not. There's a there has to be another pathway to eliminate it. I care, you care, we, everybody here in Clubhouse in this room, we care, we care passionately. You would not, people wouldn't have wasted an hour of their time on a Wednesday hey, morning. I, I, I counter, <laughs> I, I would raise my objection. I object, I object, you know, okay, the so loose sustain, language, nobody is wasting our time here, Sean. I would, <laughs> no. I would, I would sustain that objection. Okay, Thank you're right. But, well, my point, my point is that we are in the, we are in a yeah. social crisis of, unmeasurable immeasurable proportions yeah. globally when you weigh in uh when you write weigh in social justice racial justice economic justice uh health justice yeah, uh, yeah. and access to health care and access to vaccination i mean all that so 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 i believe that, it, that we don't have another 25 years we've been waiting 25 years i mean ark and engel started in 2001 so it's almost 25 years the the big companies have been kicking the can down the road well we'll get this fixed by 2005 we'll get it fixed by 2010 we'll get it we're going to get it by 2020 we're going to get it by 2025 time is up and so this is why i think it's important that one of these cases be victorious and and, and let me let me just take it a step further the tvpra the case that was filed by terry collingsworth in february federal case it's a vict it's a it's a trafficking case and the the, the standard of proof is that the defendants knowingly benefited from this behavior, that they knowingly benefited from child slavery. Yes, they did. Easy. That is a slam dunk. But let me just say something that hasn't really been talked about very much. There are actually criminal provisions in that statute. There are criminal provisions, and mm -hmm. I believe that there, there are, there's potential criminal, criminal liability for these companies that are defendants actually in the civil portion of the TVPRA case. And so I think it will take something perhaps like criminal indictments um, <clears throat> of some of these companies and for there to be corporate criminal liability, which has been around for a long, long time, um, before um, some of this stuff really gets moved off dead center. Very, very interesting. Yes. I mean, so Lynn, before before we do this, what I want to do... Sorry, I was clapping. Okay. So... Um, <laughs> And please, uh, please, um, please, uh, I apologize in advance for mispronouncing your name. Flor Kime? Um, so I, I, I'm sorry? Oh, it's Flor Kime, the R silent. Okay, Flor And, and I look at your profile and I see that you are, um, you know, you are connected um, in a number one, you are a race and ed, 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 equity advocate. And there's some connection to Liberia as well. So... Yeah, please, please. You know, I'm interested in, you know, what it is that you have to say today. I actually, this room is amazing. Usually I have a lot to say and I'm just absorbing all of this. So first of all, thank you so much for hosting this room and kind of creating the connections for folks, especially um, for people, for folks who are consuming, you know, chocolate and not, maybe not being aware. Um, Sean, I, I, I just had a couple questions, like some technical questions. Um, Lynn, you mentioned a documentary or a video. I think that can you can you mention the name again of what that was? Um, yeah, well, the first one's the dark side of chocolate, okay. and then the follow up is shady chocolate. And then, if you give me a few minutes, I always forget the third one's really hard to find, and it's called Looking for Child Slaves. I think it's a Danish documentary. Um, what I can do is send the links to Clay and he could put that on the um, 
Chocolate Life um, resource. Lynn, I will absolutely yeah. do that. So um, okay, what, I, cool. what I will say is for people who are in the room who are unfamiliar, who may be new to the room, who are attracted by the topic. So on thechocolatelife.com, what I do is I maintain a post called The Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. And on that post, you will find a link, uh, a, a calendar for every single one of the 50 some odd episodes um, of this room. Um, and for each week, there is a link to a shared folder on my Google Drive. And in that Google Drive, you will find a document which contains links to all of the resources that have been mentioned during the course of a room. And if there are any files that can be uploaded, you will find the files there. So um, Lynn, if you will send me those, what I will do is I will make sure to put them into the document. So there's already a link to the Dark Side yeah, of Chocolate no page on Wikipedia. What I can also do is I believe that the Dark Side of Chocolate is now up on YouTube. I can spend a few seconds and look for that. So Lynn, if you will find me these other resources, sure, what I will sure. do is- I also, I also have uh, an interview that I did with Mickey and Terry on our Facebook page on Join the Chocolution. Um, you can, yeah, you could find send, that on Facebook page. Send, so that, that send, the, send the link, send the link to that page to me and I will make sure that it is okay. included in no the problem. resources so we can do that. Okay. So, and then Clay is, is the, the dark, uh, is the chocolate life on clubhouse, how we can find this podcast that you're going to be um, reading? Well, there's no way for me to actually post the podcast here. Sure. So, but, okay. so I, 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 so if you go look at the schedule, Okay. After some of the rooms, you'll see the word podcast. There's a link and you click on it. And what it will do is it will take you to my channel on YouTube, which is where I host those. Right. So, okay. so what I need to do is I, so I'm recording my phone right now and that video is completely unusable. So what I need to do is I need to go down, take the video, strip the audio out, normalize the audio to make sure people who are quiet are brought up to a level and people who are loud are brought down and then sure. edit, out, edit out some egregious ums and ahs <laughs> and things like okay. that. Um, and so uh, that's actually, as you might imagine, a fairly time consuming process. And yes, so I am, way, I am way behind. But um, you will find the links to the podcast there. Okay. Right? Okay. And, and I will do a follow up. I will do an article. I want to follow up and just have an interview um, Please. With, with Sean. And I will post an article on the chocolate life. And in that article, there will be a direct link to the podcast from this hour, from this hour. Okay. okay. Um, so the, I have two final things for Sean. Um, the first part is I, I re Shana, thank you so much for just speaking on this. Um, and I, I really, you know, one of the things that you said that's really important for me sometimes is like, you know, this is, especially when you're talking about businesses and corporations, and I think it was someone else in like their bottom line, that's the most important thing, right, for them focusing when we're talking about this issue. Um, there are organizations, especially in Liberia, um, you know, have different ish things going on there, but um, there, there's a lot of civil society organizations doing things within their communities. But when we talk about impact and global impact, I think sometimes that it will take a long time. Um, and so when you mentioned that the, with these, like these criminal indictments, I completely agree. I feel like that's kind of like the best way to create impact in our lifetime. Um, especially when you think about organized companies who don't really, they don't really, they don't really care. Um, it doesn't really matter. They want their money and people are eating chocolate, you know? So I, to me, in my opinion, I feel like that's kind of like the best trajectory. Um, and then I had a final qu question, Sean, of, is there any way that folks can kind of get a hold of you or follow you after this um, um, room? Well, <clears throat> thank you. And thank you for being here. Um, I have a blog at seanaskinoc.com that I usually try to post something on a couple of times a year. And I have maybe like 14 followers, maybe 15 <laughs> after today. Um, but that there is a link there. There's a way to get a hold of me at the email address hello at seanaskinosi.com. So I'm real easy to I'm easy to find. Um, and I would say <clears throat> I would say that w when we when we think about this and we say it's going to take a long time, and we recognize that it's already taken 20 years just to get where we are, and there are some in the cocoa industry that represent big chocolate, the World Cocoa Foundation and people like that, like to say, well, we're doing better. We're doing better than we were. Well, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. There are people 
who sit at the table with with these companies, big chocolate companies. There are um, uh, so-called NGOs uh, in Europe and other places that sit with them and talk with them. And then there are people um, who partner with companies like Barry Calibo to make their chocolate for them and say, well, we're helping them, we're teaching them. And again, I would go back to my statement that the time is up. And the reason we know now, we know these things. Uh, that uh, th those of us in this room and others who are reading these things and we're seeing these documentaries that Lynn has talked about, we we know we can't unsee the things that we've seen. And so I, and so I think it's too late for appeasement. And so when you when you to me, you're either you're either um, fighting against this from the outside, which I am, or you're attempting to do something from the inside. And I believe after 20 years, if you're still doing that, that you're you are in the appeasement group and i'm done with that and i i you know those that look when we when we reach the moral place where we say which oh by the way we did say the same thing uh uh before during and after the civil war uh, in the united states uh over the cotton industry well what are we gonna do what's gonna happen to the price of cotton what will happen to all the industry what will happen because the uk is buying uh, 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 Britain's buying all, all of our cotton. And what, 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 oh my gosh, the sky is falling. What's going to happen? Well, we didn't say, or maybe we did, but it didn't last very long. Well, ah, maybe we need to keep slavery in place because there are a lot of industries, depending on the price of cotton, we better, we, I guess we're just going to go ahead and do it. We're not going to, you know, we're, we're just going to let it happen. No, we must, we must make a moral um, hierarchy almost like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. And we must say that I'm sorry, under any circumstance, using child slaves, it's not gonna happen. And then after that, I'm sorry, adult slaves and forced labor, I'm, that's just, I'm, we're, we're, we're just we, we, we don't care what the ramifications are of that not happening. We are not going to allow it. And we will come up with the social programs and the market, which will address this, We've, we've seen this before. We can do this. We can provide safety nets. Yes, but we can't make that, we can't make it conditional. We can't say, well, I'll tell you what, we're gonna let there be child slaves. We're gonna let 10 year olds um, use a machete for 12 hours a day uh, and, we're, and, and not pay them and live in terrible conditions and be punished when they don't work hard enough as slaves are. And we're just gonna let that happen and and then uh, and then we'll figure out what's going to happen with the market later no we 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 must not be in that position because there are look <clears throat> the big chocolate nestle all these people say well gosh we can't pay more for cocoa beans we can't pay a living income differential we can't raise the price of our chocolate bars bs they've done it over the last 20 years in the in the cpg world it's called taking price uh, that's their term of art that they use. They've taken price plenty of times. Why? Because other ingredient prices have gone up. Packaging prices have gone up. Labor prices have gone up. And, and oh, by the way, there are multiple studies that say that chocolate is an inelastic good. That means that when the price goes up for chocolate, people still buy it. We know this. There, the, the, this, this is not, there's not a debate about this. And so, <clears throat> and so the industry, Nestle, Mars, Mars Hershey, Barry Calibo, Tony's, others, they yeah. can raise the price of their chocolate bar. They can raise the price of their chocolate bar. They can take price and people will still buy it. They will be more profitable and the farm gate price will be higher and we will find a, a significant minimization of child slave labor. That's what needs to happen. It can happen. People are still gonna buy chocolate bars. Why should somebody get to sell their chocolate bar for $1.50 at the counter at a convenience store and people complain that my chocolate bar at $10 is a ripoff? No, the ripoff is the $1.50 chocolate bar at the counter because it's been, it's been produced on the backs of child slaves and other slaves. That's just, I'm, I mean, that's not acceptable. Yeah, from a market price mechanism perspective, Sean, and people may not uh, be aware of it, is that on a adjusted for inflation, the cost of cocoa now is less expensive than it was in the 1980s. And I challenge anybody mm -hmm. to think of any yep. product or service 
which is less expensive now, except maybe computer chips in based on, you know, number of MIPS um, per, per second. Uh, well, th that's redundant, but in, you know, in terms of processing power, I mean, there are very few things in the world that are less expensive now than they were 35 years ago. Um, and that have also experienced that, yes, have, that have yes. also experienced a counterbalancing explosion in yeah. demand. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, really well worth um, taking into consideration. Hey, Eric, um, we'd love to hear what you have to say about this. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, Clay, good morning. Sean, good morning. Um, and everyone is here. Um, being in the industry for about 10 years, going on the 11 years, uh, vertically integrated, owning my own farm and, you know, controlling the whole process from end to end, I've gained an appreciation for the industry uh, when I got started. And, and we do have to admit that from the premium perspective, we're making progress and we're bringing awareness to quality product. Okay, and I think the consumers are also uh, doing the same. But I have this model that I always say that every time a consumer purchases cheap chocolate, they're investing in the poverty of the farm. I've always said that. I even said it at one of the World Cocoa Conferences that I attended. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, keep this in mind, and this is across all commodities. Every time you export raw material, you're exporting cash, jobs, and wealth. So a lot of cocoa producing countries are recognizing okay, now more than ever that they must turn up the engine within their countries when it comes to processing. Okay? Now, there's a lot of challenges with that, infrastructures and a whole bunch of other things. But let me just give you a true case study. Nigeria is the fourth, fifth largest cocoa producer in the world. They export cocoa, they import over $80 million worth of chocolate, okay? So they have to address internally processing, consumption, but when you talk about processing, you have to talk about capacity building. A cocoa producing country cannot aspire to become a well-known chocolate maker, chocolate consumers, if they don't have the capacity within the country to do those things. And a lot of those things come down to infrastructure and uh, the ability to train individuals in these countries in learning and knowing how to process quality product because you're never gonna be able to compete under the mass production, okay? So my model's always been capacity building at origin, reduction of export of your raw materials and process and gain market access. All, now, again, all of those things are extremely hard to do. I'm in that space, I understand it, but to eradicate poverty is the reduction of exporting your raw materials. There's no reason why I cannot partner with cocoa producing countries and have them manufacture the chocolate based on my specification, as long as they're trained and have the infrastructure and, and, and the proper mechanism of getting that done, and instantly I'm just a chocolatier, right? Because every time we accept raw materials out of any country, we are robbing them of their wealth. That's the bottom line. And that's what I wanted to share. And I may have a lot of opposition to it, but that's the core of my blood. No, Eric, I, you know, I, I, I'm in fundamental agreement um, with a lot of what it is that you have to say. Um, you know, first, you know, I would say, you know, part of the part of the challenge from the very beginning is we're thinking of cocoa as a commodity. And I think that the commodification commodification of agriculture, any agricultural product is, you know, is a part of it. So you have people who are betting that the price will go down and they're making decisions, you know, without really understanding what the impact might be on a farmer if what they're doing is they're exerting negative pricing pressure. It's it's just an insane system. Yes, Sean. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say thank you, Eric. I mean, I think that's yeah. a great point. I would take it a step further and say we need to increase demand for cocoa products in cocoa producing countries. Why? Because when we increase demand, we're also going to be uh, creating shortages and shortages will create increase in price in the commodity itself. So I, I agree with you. And I think we need more cocoa consumption in cocoa producing countries. Mm -hmm. I also think that ultimately, yes, from a macro from a macroeconomic standpoint, I don't disagree with anything that uh, he just said. Nothing. Yep. Uh, I would say 
however, though, that we could we could say it another way and say, ultimately, this is a math question. I mean, this is a question of of a math question as it relates to the poverty of the individual person affected by what Eric just said. So in other words, is the farmer making more money? Do they have more disposable income? Have they been raised out of extreme poverty as defined by the United Nations at $1.25 a day? That's a, that's a, is it yes or is it no? Mm -hmm. So his model that he just proposed, which I don't disagree with, we, and, and when we say, well, who, wh what's better for the farmer? It's a math question because Yes, it may be better, but what if that farmer is selling in country um, and we, we, can, we can look at study after study about income inequality in countries of origin, because it exists. Mm -hmm. I can, we can talk for another hour about what's happened in places like Madagascar and other places. But, but, but my, my point is, is that, is that um, we, 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 we look at income inequality as it relates to the farmer who's receiving a higher farm gate from say someone like me, which I publish on my website, by the way, Every, every single contract I've had for the last 14 years, what I've paid farmers directly, and, and it's just a question of math. Is it better for the farmer, in that case, to get what I pay them and the profit share that I give them? Or is it better for them to, as, as, as Eric said, you know, there to be a capacity building and for them to mm -hmm. um, have a value add? It just depends. It really depends on the situation. But the point that he's making I agree, is a Sean, good one. I agree. And it's I a good one. I also agree that it's a very complex situation. Wow. Very complex. But the beauty about this, Sean, is the fact that people like you, people like Clay and myself and others, we're having those discussions and we're trying to find. And you know what? The solution may not just be, uh, you know, just one type of solution. It's multifaceted. Wow. So yeah. um, the continuation of these conversations and the continuation of really trying to find a solution, I think we do have to applaud ourselves that, you know, 25, 30 years ago, it didn't exist. It will exist now. Yeah. And you're right. right. In, in origin, they are paying a lot of attention to this and they are yep. looking for solutions. So people like us can help guide that internally in country. And, and even internally in country, there, there are complex issues with politics and, and a whole bunch of other things that are yep. internally who you know colluding with these multi multinational yes. companies that are continuing yes. to keep well. things the way they are so so yes. i agree now yeah. I, I apologize i have to leave but clay and sean it's a pleasure and i and just keep up the good work oh thank you eric thank you. as and, always and, thank you and i and i would just say let me let me follow on with what, what he said that's really important you know ghana um uh, just six months ago said oh we're not we're not selling you anymore um coco to his point we're gonna we're gonna process it we're gonna say now that the, they backed off of that but can you imagine if ghana's government said we're not selling cocoa beans to you anymore we're going to sell you liquor well i mean that the, there's a value add and eric right. is exactly right i mean but it would, sean it would in, in terms it of the, happen, right? but in terms of the complexity of the situation right the challenge becomes you'll have multinational companies investing in all of the infrastructure, which includes not only processing <clears throat> capacity, but now we're talking about yep. transportation equality, right? So you need to get mm -hmm. to and from the farms. How do you guarantee mm -hmm. in terms of the investment infrastructure that the that actually any of that money gets back to the farmer? <laughs> so yeah, you can you can well, increase the investment in processing mm -hmm. infrastructure, but you but without a mechanism to make sure that the farmers are rewarded. Um, you know, now what you've just done is you've just widened yes. the, the income inequality gap. Which is what happened in fair trade. Yeah, in absolutely. Fiscal. Absolutely. And, 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 and this is what's happened in fair trade. It's what's happened in mass balance. You uh -huh. should do an entire show on mass balance. Well, you taught me. I was in the industry for 14 years and didn't even know what it was until yeah. you taught me. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a whole other okay. show. Right. For you. So but anyway, what I want to do is I want to bring Nitin and Lucia. Um, I want to ask them a couple of questions. But what I do want to say to Sean is we're at 10 minutes past 11. I'm really, really appreciative of the time you've given me today. One of the things I would like to do is I'd like to bring you back and just talk just about the Askinosi journey. Um, as the part of a series um, about chocolate makers and what it is that they're doing. I'm trying to get, you know, Simran Bindra, who's, you know, who runs Coco Camilli. You know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to bring a lot of different voices from a lot of different parts of the world. Um, and if what we'd like to do is we'd like to um, talk about the Askinosi journey, the things you're doing in Davao, the things you're doing in Tanzania, the, you know, the initial disappointments, you know, that you both and I, both you and I shared with, you know, our visits to both Mexico and Venezuela. 
in 2006, which you intimated at earlier. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff there. And if you'd be willing to come back again, I would love to have sure. start those conversations. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Great. Thank you very much. Um, so Nitin, you're calling from India today. Um, welcome to the Daily Open Chocolate Chat. Thanks. Thanks, Clay. Uh, pleasure as always. Uh, and as every day, I must say, I'm quite regular to, to all the conversations that you've been having. Um, I, I actually have a question. Um, do, do we feel that the same problems of what we've been discussing for the last one hour exist in newer origins of cacao? And the reason I'm asking that is uh, I work very, very closely with farmers across all the regions in India and I work directly with them. Uh, and I have never seen uh, child labor ever in India in cacao. And I've always seen the farmer getting paid more than um, w what he would get, you know, otherwise uh, when he adds value to the fermentation and drying. So to me, though I, I could be a part of the third world country, you know, India, a, a developing country, but I don't see that problem at all. It, it doesn't exist. It's not a conversation. It's not a debate in India. So I'm just wondering whether that's the case in other newer origins of cacao, just like India. Well, Sean, you're working in Tanzania and uh, you're working in the Philippines um, it, to some extent. I don't know if they're newer or not, but can you speak from your personal experience yeah. there? <clears throat> well, I would say the short answer is no, I don't think there are problems in 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 newer origins. Um, but I think there's a coupling that's happened that he mentioned in his um, s statement, which has to do with price. So I think there's a causal relationship, and I just sent you a study, Clay, that I hope you can share with your listeners in your folder, um, a, a fairly recent study that, re that relates to this issue of price and slavery, and, and 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 with good results. And so I think that's maybe what we've seen. Now I don't think it's been a, a by design. You know I don't think that the Philippines said when they were starting their cook. Well, actually, that, I, it's new, not new. I mean, the Spanish right. brought it there in 1600, but then they, they, we were the first to export it out of there after their land reform, um, you know, which, um, so anyway, but my point is, is that no, I don't think in newer, in newer places, I certainly haven't seen it in my uh, little spot of the world that I travel to in Tanzania or in the Amazon or in uh, the areas around Waikil where I've been buying for 15 years and I don't, uh, and I don't see it in Davao, never seen it in Davao. So I, um, so no. So short answer is no. I don't think so. And I think it's related to price. Right. Th thanks a lot for that, Sean. And Clay, if I can ask just one more question. Of course. Uh, uh, rather, it's not a question. It's just an observation, which I think will surprise a lot of us in this room. Um, as of last week in India, there is a, a particular state where the government has come up with a tender uh, and it's an open tender for anyone to participate, uh, uh, you know, for the tender where they're asking uh, people to set up processing units to help farmers. So the intention is to sell liquor to people and, and not, uh, you know, try and sell beans and, and then be a part of all of this, uh, uh, you know, business related supply chain issue. So th it's one step perhaps in the right direction, but I was quite surprised to learn about it last week. And it's a tender which is going to open up very soon. So I think we're learning a bit from the problems that the world faces and Maybe some some good guy is trying to find a solution here in India. Well, I mean, uh, I am interested, you know, in meeting if you can share um, anything in English that might exist um, on any of these um, initiatives. I'd be happy to share them, um, you know, on the Chocolate Life, um, you oh, know, sure. just, just to let sure. people know I... about it. And say, Sean, I did get the link to the study that you were mentioning, and I will, I will post it. Um, so, um, Lucia, welcome to the Daily Open Chocolate Chat. Hello, as always, enjoying the chocolate life and all the discussion that is taking place. I, I wanted to make a comment. Um, uh, I don't remember if it was this year, early this year or last year. I was reading an art article in LinkedIn where it mentioned that Hershey was not going to pay the Ghanaian chocolate cacao farmers. They had decided right. to not... Uh, 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 Follow the contracts that had already uh, been yep. established, and so when I read this, uh, I was I was really I was angry, and mm -hmm. being a Hershey dark chocolate powder consumer to prepare my 
hot chocolate in, in my house, I decided I'm not going to buy Hershey's powder, 100% chocolate. I'm going to try to see if I can find some local product that substitutes this because it is not fair what they did. And uh, what I want to say with this is that I found an alternative product here at Honduran, a 100% chocolate powder, and now I'm buying that. And my point here what, that I want to make is the role of us as consumers in impacting on the market mm -hmm. so that big companies make changes. You know, When we, as, uh, as consumers, mm -hmm. make informed decisions and inform and, and changes in the way that we consume things, uh, then we, we can little by little impact the market and make, make these companies change, make, make them make changes because it, they'll, it'll impact on their economy. So it's very mm -hmm. important. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. And not only thank you for saying it, thank you for doing something about it. You, you, you are who we hope to reach. I mean, this is, so thank you. You didn't just say something about it or talk about it or post about it. You actually, you actually behaved with your wallet in a way that would be consistent with your <clears throat> feeling. And, and when, when Hershey did that, which we were alluding to earlier um, in the program, and I don't know if you were on, but, but Hershey said openly, publicly, we are not paying the living income differential that we said we would pay. When we we're not doing it, <laughs> and here here we have you reading this article on LinkedIn. Thank you, and 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 acting accordingly. And so this is this this you know this this is what needs to happen globally, and and this is how we make change. Uh, you know this 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 is not going this to me this is where appeasement is no longer a viable option. Appeasement with these people, sitting down with them, helping them nuance their way into the abuse of children on years on into the future is not acceptable. And so in my view, the signal to noise ratio regarding um, social justice is, is impossible. So like I said earlier, we have you know, racial injustice, social injustice, economic injustice, uh, climate injustice, health injustice, we have all of these things in there. And, and, and sometimes if you sit down at your computer and you read, you're, you, you cry, you, you, tears come to your eyes because it's overwhelming. And we find ourselves almost just kind of paralyzed by heartbreak and saying, there's nothing we can do. We can't do it. There's too much. I can't take it. There's too much sorrow. There's too much sadness. And so I, I'm just, I, 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 I can't do anything today. But we have to be there to support each other. Like Clay has developed in this room and the people in, in, this, um, um, in this room and in this discussion, because <laughs> in my view, these, these people at these companies need to be in jail, okay? They don't need to be appeased. They need to be indicted. And the and companies need to stop selling their chocolate. Um, and we, we as consumers, once we know, we need to stop buying it. We need to protest. We need a revolution to stop this. That's what's gonna stop it. I mean, um, but as I said, the signal to noise ratio mm -hmm. on these issues is overwhelming because there are so many other very important issues like people dying globally of a pandemic, people dying because of social, because of racial injustice, people dying at the hands of guns that shouldn't be permitted in the United States. I mean, we're, we're you know, there's a lot for us to think about. And so we do the best we can, you know, we start a new day, we do the best we can. And I think some, can I just say something? No, I think it's very important that um, the importance of the civil society, uh, not only on the impact we can have on our governments, but the impact that we can have on markets and the economy. And sometimes people, we are not aware of that. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Sean, um, I want to thank you. Um, I think that you've brought not just you know the sort of the 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 point of view of the lawyer that you were um and that sort of precision in terms of understanding and being able to pull apart um, these um the different aspects of the um the challenges which are faced uh, but also to do some do so in in an eloquent and passionate manner 
because I think that you know fundamentally uh, the challenge that you presented is how do we get people to care? And if we can get people to care, then then we have advanced towards you know finding a common ground, and we can work towards finding solutions to the problems. But getting people to care is the real challenge, and I think that one of the the great things that you've done over the course of the last hour or so here is helped people understand why they should care. Of course, I believe that most of these people in this room already knew that. Um, mm-hmm. But what we now have is uh, a, a more nuanced understanding of the challenges, and so we can be better communicators. And also, I think you, you, you know, Lucia is absolutely right that you know we individually, each of us, has the power to uh, influence the market by the decisions that we make. Uh, we had a, a, a room a couple of weeks ago, Sean, about quality, and I made the notion that you know, quality is a basket of attributes. And everybody has different attributes in their basket, and they value those attributes very, very differently. But that ultimately, the definition of quality is in the wallet of the buyer, and that the power of the wallet uh, is is bigger than I think um, we know when we can get together and work together. And I think that you know this this we we we've talked about that um, today, and the understanding about what is at stake with respect not only to the alien tort statue, the Nestle v. Cargill, or the Nestle and Cargill um, case, as well as the, the TVPRA case, which was just filed. You know, this is just a really, really fabulous insight into, um, you know, a, 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 an inflection point where massive change will occur under, uh, in a very short period of time, but only if there is um, a win on behalf of the plaintiffs in either or both of these cases.